Legend is one of the great, underrated fantasy films of the 1980s. Director Ridley Scott and screenwriter William Yortsberg had one goal in mind, to create a brand new and original fairy tale for the screen. They used several classic fairy tale story tropes. The resulting film is brimming with ideas and gorgeous imagery. The film is pure fantasy. Yet despite this, there are countless little moments throughout it that could easily be mistaken for horror. Had Ridley Scott and William Yortsberg only tuned the story a little bit differently, Legend could have qualified as a horror film. And it comes close. Had it been made in the 1930s, we would likely have thought of it as fantasy horror. But by contemporary standards, this film is simply labeled Dark Fantasy. Here are some other Dark Fantasy films. The Black Cauldron, The Craft, Edward Scissorhands, Coraline, Army of Darkness, Snow White, A Tale of Terror, Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunters, Faust. Here are some films not considered dark fantasy, but merely labeled regular fantasy. The Wizard of Oz, Willow, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, The Neverending Story, The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. The Thief of Baghdad, La Belle et la Bête. The point I'm trying to make here is that horror films and fantasy films have a lot in common. If we're going to explore the border between fantasy and horror cinema, then it might be useful to first look at fantasy films and the specifics of the genre. First off, what exactly is a fantasy film? There's high fantasy, which deals with a more traditional fairy tale sensibility including such creatures as dragons and witches and werewolves. There's urban fantasy, which is fantasy stories set in contemporary worlds. Then there's Gaslamp, like the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and Van Helsing. There's low fantasy, like the Indian in the cupboard and the borrowers. We have magic realism, like Beasts of the Southern Wild and the Purple Rose of Cairo. There's paranormal romance, akin to Twilight and beautiful creatures, and there are so many, many more. Complicating things, we also have the adventure film. The fantasy and the adventure genre are often confused for one another. For instance, adventure films like the Indiana Jones series belong in the adventure category, but there are fantasy elements present. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, we're talking about Christian and specifically Jewish mythology with the Ark of the Covenant. In the Temple of Doom, we get a bit closer to fantasy in that the religious aspects are more foreign to Western audiences such as myself. Oh, and the religious aspects here are treated with less respect. In The Last Crusade, the entire plot unfolds like a classic adventure quest, akin to what a knight might experience in a fantasy story, yet it is set in the late 1930s. And then there's Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, where we get the entirely fantastical notion that someone can survive a nuclear blast while hiding inside a lead-lined fridge. Classic adventures often featured lost cultures, rediscovered treasures, and various supernatural elements. But they were often far more adventure-oriented than fantasy-oriented. There might be monsters, and there might be eternal life given by the fire of the gods. But that was as far as it went. Adventure films and fantasy films were clearly meant to differ from each other. Because while adventure stories were built on more human endeavors, like exploration, all of fantasy was built on mythology. And mythology is supremely rich. The history of our culture is written in our mythology. Not trying to offend any Christians here, but if you think about it, the Bible is one of the truly great pieces of mythological storytelling, and it is rife with rich fantasy material. Again, I'm not trying to mock religion, because so much of what we see in our fantasy stories come from various mythologies, which means from our religious beliefs and stories tied to how our ancestors try to understand the mysterious world around them. 
it follows that our fears were represented in these mythological stories. We were scared of a wrathful god, or gods depending on which culture you hail from, and the wrath of the heavens often manifested itself in monsters. Take for instance Greek mythology, which is one of the strongest points of origin for the modern fantasy genre. In Greek mythology, heroes faced off with titans and medusas and minotaurs, who were all present in the world due to some action of the gods. With the spread of Christianity in the Western world, older religions were cast aside. This allowed for the stories to no longer be of religious consequence, no longer to be attributed to the gods, and thus many of the tales from early religions morphed into fairy tales. We began seeing an oral storytelling tradition with roots from the epic poem. Let's take a closer look at one story in particular. Don't trust that wolf, little girl. He has unclean intentions. The fairy tale Little Red Riding Hood has been interpreted as an allegory for puberty, and it has also been interpreted as a parable about the cycle of day and night, with the big bad wolf tied to Norse mythology, where the wolf Fenrir swallowed the sun to create night. More recently, the tale has become about sex, and or rape, and or eroticism. Which one is it? Heck if I know. But there's about a thousand years of recorded history where this particular fantasy story has been around, and it likely existed even before that, we just don't have any records of the previous incarnations. Common to these versions is that it deals with elements of horror. Fear is an important part of fantasy, and this is true of many fairy tales and fantasy stories of old. Fear, in fact, is one of the most common themes of fairy tales, and as the fantasy genre is primarily inspired by fairy tales and religious mythology, it follows that fantasy fiction and horror fiction share a close historical bond. In cinema, the two genres cross over again and again. In fantasy films, we often see horror tropes intrude on the proceedings. In the contemporary fantasy series Harry Potter, creator J.K. Rowling uses countless horror elements, like possessing someone else's body, and werewolves and the undead, and curses. In the fantasy film La Belle et la Bête, director Jean Cocteau used fantasy imagery that later directors Roman Polanski and George Romero found useful in their horror films. Cinematic geniuses like F.W. Murnau and Walt Disney drew from mythology in their representations of devils and demons, which later inspired cultural images shared between contemporary horror and fantasy and it is nearly impossible to untangle what exactly is horror and what is fantasy. Let's flip the context and now look at horror films where fantasy intrudes. In Mario Bava's omnibus horror film Black Sabbath, the episode The Wordalak features Boris Karloff as a 19th century man returning home to his family after slaying a mythological terror known as, you guessed it, The Wordalak. The Wordalak is a living cadaver that feeds on the blood of humans. Basically, it's a vampire. When Boris Karloff returns home, wouldn't you know it, he has a craving for human blood. This is classic horror, but it's filmed like a dark fairy tale. Here's another example. In the family-friendly horror film Something Wicked This Way Comes, two children must face off against a sinister traveling carnival where its ringmaster, Mr. Dark, clearly has evil intentions for any and all paying customers. The story is pure horror, but it's also heavily influenced by fantasy, both in the way the story is told, in the visual style of the film, and in the portrayal of Mr. Dark by Jonathan Price. Price's villain ties closely to the classic portrayals of the devil, in that he collects the souls of poor schmucks who just wanted to have a good time out among strongmen and bearded ladies. We can all relate. In Dario Argento's most beloved film, Suspiria, a young woman discovers that her school is run by a coven of witches. Giallo-style horrors ensue. Suspiria is pure horror, but its villains are witches. Pure fantasy fairy tale stuff. Now, I could go on further about witches and their use as horror villains, but I think they, like the devil, deserve their own episode at some later date. All in good time. But for now, 
While Suspiria is clearly a horror film, fantasy elements intrude and influence and bubble bubble toil and trouble, scares are served up aplenty. <laughs> Some horror films go even more directly to the fantasy source. The enjoyable, if rather goofy horror film Leprechaun serves up an amusing villain in an honest to god bloodthirsty Leprechaun. Is that me gold? In the Hammer Studios film The Gorgon, Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee are tasked with fighting off a Medusa, straight out of Greek mythology. And in the excellent horror fantasy comedy The Troll Hunter, several hapless documentary filmmakers meet trolls. If you're Norwegian, or have had the pleasure of hearing a few Norwegian fairy tales, it is quite clear that fantasy has found itself a nice new home in the found footage horror flick. And in our final horror example, Drag Me to Hell, a curse worthy of any mythological or religious background finds a contemporary woman with a subtly disguised eating disorder. And it makes her life a living hell before actually dragging her to hell. So what did we learn? If anything, I think the conclusion we have to draw is that fantasy and horror are linked from childhood. These two genres grew up together. Their parents were mythology and fairy tales. And now horror and fantasy are siblings. They often look alike, yet there are clear and definable differences. Horror films have their own personality, and so do fantasy films. Not to beat this metaphor to death, but I like to think of horror cinema as the younger sibling, one that often learns from fantasy, taking inspiration from its older brother. And thus, the border between fantasy and horror is incredibly vague. I wanted to cover one last thing here, and that is films that could be said to be exactly equal, as if horror and fantasy came together, um, intimately. Okay, this is a bit incestuous, as I just compared the genres to siblings, but I suppose this was meant to be, as the filmmaker I want to cover at the end of this episode is Guillermo del Toro, who made Crimson Peak, a horror film about incestuous siblings. Del Toro is one of the finest filmmakers of our generation. More about him in the next episode. But for now, let's just say that while a lot of his material fits into the horror mold, Guillermo del Toro likes to say he makes modern fairy tales. One of his best films is Pan's Labyrinth. And I think this film is one of the most appropriate films to end this episode on, because it is both fantasy and horror. The horror elements of the story are all tied to the fantasy tropes learned from generations of filmmakers, and before them, from storytellers who regale generations past with fairy tales and mythology. And the fantasy elements are equally born out of horror, in this case not just horror as in monsters of both human and mythological appearance, but also out of the horrors of civil war. The sense of dread experienced by young heroine Ophelia is manifested out from her harsh life, set in the period immediately following the Spanish Civil War. This was a time of dictators and tyrants and human monsters, but for Ophelia it is also a time of fantasy and otherworldly experience, the way a child sees a world she can't yet fully comprehend. The fantasy is real to her, both in her imagination and in her path in life. It is so real because it's culturally ingrained in her as a child, and the film's conclusion, which sees her take her place on the throne of a fantasy realm, speaks to the realness and influence fantasy has on our lives. Del Toro treats this aspect of the story with the utmost seriousness, and we as audiences reap the enormous benefits. So, horror is a form of fantasy, and fantasy is often inspired by fear. The genres are very close to one another, and that has given us a rich mythology, in either realm, under either label, from which we can experience the world and try to make sense of it, whether we try to understand the phenomenons of our worlds, or things that go bump in the night, or the horrors of real life, or the horrors of our dreams. Fantasy and horror are forever linked, and they will intersect again and again and again, and we are all the richer for it. My name is Wolf Craft. This is History of Horror. Join me next time for Kindness in a Dark World, an episode about the filmmaking of Guillermo del Toro. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to like, share, and subscribe.
If you're interested in checking out some of my other work, I'm also an author. My science fiction novel, God of Desolation, is available on Amazon. Please check it out, and if you're very kind to me, leave me a review on Amazon. Thanks a plenty.